Well, a packed house. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the latest installment in our lecture series on leading voices in politics and policy. My name is Dean Lacey, a professor of government here, and it's my pleasure to welcome back to Dartmouth uh, Robert Reich, class of 68. Um, after leaving Dartmouth, uh, Robert Reich boarded a boat to England where uh, he became a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University in the prestigious politics, philosophy, and economics program, along with a man named Bill Clinton. Um, he returned uh, back to the United States and got a JD from Yale Law School, um, became a lawyer for a while, decided, thankfully for us, that that wasn't to his liking, then became a professor at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, where he wrote a series of articles and books uh, that became highly influential on how to invest in human capital. Um, an aspiring presidential candidate, uh, his friend Bill Clinton, uh, was persuaded by these books and upon being elected president, uh, called Robert Reich and asked him to head his economic transition team and then to become Secretary of Labor. During Reich's first, his term as Secretary of Labor, we passed the uh, Family and Medical Leave Act. Um, after, his, uh, after the 1996 election, Robert Reich decided to return to private life where he became a professor at Brandeis University and is currently a professor of public policy at uh, the University of California Book, at Berkeley. He's written too many books for me to mention in the introduction, but the latest is um, Aftershock, The Next Economy in America's Future, uh, which I read on a plane returning from China on Sunday. And I can tell you that um, among the many interesting things in this book, it's, it's a book about the growing wealth gap between uh, the haves and have-nots in America and what we can do about it. But he has the best explanation I've heard from any policymaker or pundit about why, why China undervalues its currency. And he does it in two sentences. But to know what he says, you'll have to buy the book. So please join me in welcoming Robert Reich. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's, uh, it is so nice to be here. Uh, I came to New Hampshire to announce my candidacy for, no, sorry, it's not true. Um, you know, uh, before the current economic downturn, I was six foot four. It's, that is actually true. Thank you, Dean. Uh, you know, I, I, when I met uh, Dean this morning, I thought he was Dean Lacey. I thought he was a dean. And he said, no, my name is... Dean. And then I thought he was Dean Dean, like Major Major. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh, Dartmouth has, uh, it's been a lovely day. I just taught a class uh, in, uh, in government and economics. Uh, one thing I did not know when I taught that class just now is what happened to the stock market today. You know what happened. The stock market lost 500, the Dow lost 500 points. Uh, four percent of its value in one day. So I thought that I would talk about that. Okay? Would you like to know why it happened and what's going to happen? Would you like to know exactly where the Dow is going to be <laughs> next week? Uh, you know, politics and economics are inextricably related. And, and before, I'm going to get back to the Dow. Uh, but before 1890, when Alfred Marshall wrote his wonderful Principles of Economics, uh, the two fields were the same. It was called, called political economy. And nobody thought there was really much difference between economics and politics. You couldn't talk about one without talking about the other. Uh, but once we had this field, this new field called economics, then the economists all went in one direction and political scientists went in another direction. Uh, but the most interesting truths are found in the interstices between economics and politics. Don't believe that they can be so easily separated. Actually, if you go back another century to the 18th century, Adam Smith did not call himself a political economist or an economist. He called himself a moral philosopher. Because in the 18th century, not only was there no politics and no economics as separate disciplines, but 
ethics, the question of what is a good society, what does a good society look like, was the center of this kind of inquiry. And so moral philosophy was very much a part of the discussion. Where are we going and what do we want as a community, as a country, as a society? So where are we going? And what do we want? Uh, let me suggest to you that we have been spending an inordinate amount of time as a nation debating something that is really not and should not be an issue or a crisis, and neglecting something that really is and should be the center of our discussion and is a crisis. The non-issue and non-crisis is the federal debt. The issue and the crisis is jobs, wages, and economic growth. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is not a great barometer. Uh, in fact, you can't really read much into one day's performance. It could be that it reverses itself tomorrow. But in general, the Dow hasn't done terribly well this week. And so there may be something going on. Maybe individual investors who, by the way, are not ideological, are not really motivated by anything but the reality of making a return on their investments. Individual investors may be onto something that Washington has been neglecting. The debt ceiling fight succeeded in the sense that the full faith and credit of the United States is now honored. We didn't have an interruption. There was no default. And many people in Washington who I talk with and who I admire, many people in Washington told me last week, once we get this behind us, once we lift the debt ceiling, once we no longer have this sword of Damocles hanging over us, which is the possibility of default, everything will be fine. We'll, we'll just, uh, the economy will mend itself. I was skeptical. I'm skeptical because those of you who've been following the data coming out of the Commerce Department and the Labor Department and all of the other data we have know that Confounding a lot of economic forecasters, the United States economy grew almost not at all in the first half of this year, almost dead in the water. And confounding a lot of predictions from a lot of people, unemployment was also very high. Very few jobs have been created. And let me just say to you, in normal circumstances, this degree of slow economic growth and high unemployment would be a concern. But under current circumstances, when we are still in the gravitational pull of a great recession, when we are still coming out of the deepest trough in terms of growth and job loss we've had since the Great Depression, what you would hope for, what you would expect in a healthy economy would be a bounce back. In 1934, coming out of the deepest trough of the Great Depression, the economy grew around 4.5% that year. 1935, it grew over 70%. 1936, the economy grew 14.5%. You see, you get this bounce back. The lower you are, the more you have to bounce back in order to get back on track, the track you are on. That's what you expect. We're not bouncing back at all. The trough of 2008 was not nearly as deep as the trough of 1933. But nevertheless, it was the deepest we've had since 1933, possible exception of 1981, but that's a technical quibble because most recessions we've had up until now, between the Great Depression and this past Great Recession, if you want to call it that, most of those recessions between these two cataclysmic events were brought on by the Federal Reserve Board raising interest rates too high relative to the fear, usually a legitimate fear, of inflation, and then having to backtrack. 
But in 1933, in fact, in 1929, and in, 19, and in 2007 and 2008, you had something very different happen. You had the collapse of major asset bubbles. And when you have a major asset bubble collapse, all of the normal economic rules, the normal expectations have to be put aside. Something else fundamental is going on. What's going on? What's going on is a crisis of what economists call aggregate demand. There's just not enough buying going on to fuel a recovery. Consumers in the United States are 70 percent of the economy. Consumers are still overwhelmed with debt. Their major asset for most people is their homes, if they have any assets at all. And home values have dropped 33 percent since 2006, on average, around the country. You know, I am a good in economic indicator, kind of in a backwards way, because my own financial strategy in my life has been to buy high, sell low. Watch me and do the opposite. I bought a house in Berkeley, California, not only in 2006 at the height of the housing market, but in April of 2006, which out there was the highest level housing prices had ever reached. And the moment I bought that house, in fact, I think the second I bought the house, <laughs> the bubble burst. Now, when you have that kind of a negative wealth effect, on top of the fact that the 401k plans of many people uh, have lost a lot of ground, still haven't made up the ground that they lost in 2008, on top of the fact that people are very worried about their jobs. You have kind of a vicious cycle. People are worried about their jobs. Median wages are going down. If they're worried about their jobs and wages and their major asset has dropped in value, and they can't borrow against their homes any longer because the homes don't, are not worth that much, and banks are now much more prudent, thank goodness, about lending. If all that's going on, where is the demand coming from? Now, at the very top of the market, in terms of luxury goods, there is still demand. People at the very top are still doing fine. Mercedes scored its most, the, almost the largest sales it has ever had in the last few months. But if you get down to the major companies that are selling to Americans, retailers, major distributors, manufacturers, service businesses, you find that their American businesses have almost collapsed. Businesses are not going to hire unless they have customers. Can we be clear about this? It's not. You know, I, I go sometimes on television and I debate people who say things like, well, the ra major reason businesses are not hiring is because their taxes are too high. The major reason businesses are not hiring is because of uncertainty about the future. The major business, the major reason businesses are not hiring is because of too much regulation. Well, look, even if I grant that uncertainty and regulation and the cost of capital may contribute to this, it's hard to believe because big companies are sitting on $2 trillion of cash right now, but even if you I accede to these ideas and say, okay, there's a little bit of credence, by far, talk to anybody, small businesses, large businesses, anybody who knows anything about the economy, and you see the reason they're not hiring is because they don't have customers. They don't know that there will be customers out there. No business in its right mind would make the investment in additional capacity if there are not customers. And that's the vicious cycle we are in. Go back with me a couple of years, you see that this vicious cycle actually has its origins quite a number of years ago. It was in the late 70s that median incomes started to flatten out. Americans continued to buy 
I mean, Europeans and, ja and, and chi Japanese and Chinese I used to talk about American consumers as the energizer bunnies. They just keep on buying. How did Americans keep on buying even though median incomes flattened? Because of three coping mechanisms. Number one, women went into paid work. Huge avalanche of women into paid work starting in the late 70s. Number two, Everybody worked longer hours. By the 1990s, when I was labor secretary, I'd look at the data and be amazed at the extent to which Americans were working, working longer hours than even the industrious Japanese. But there is a limit to those two coping mechanisms. Third coping mechanism, going into debt, using the homes as ATMs. But there's a limit to that, too, because once the debt bubble burst, as inevitably it's going to burst, and the housing bubble burst, you can't do that anymore. And so you have built into the structure of the economy, built into the fact that median wages have flattened out for 30 years, you've got the seed corn for a crisis that we saw developing, and it is a crisis of aggregate demand. Why today? Why did the Dow Jones choose today? Largely, I think, because they anticipate that tomorrow's employment report is going to be terribly disappointing. We need 125,000 new jobs per month just to keep up with the population growth. But for the past several months, we've come way short of 125,000. In other words, every month we don't hit 125,000, we have more unemployed. The army of the unemployed or underemployed, and let me define this. When I say underemployed, I mean people who are working part-time who'd rather be working full-time, or people who are working in jobs for which they're way overqualified, a lot of young college graduates, for example. And then you also add to the army of underemployed and unemployed people who are too discouraged even to look for work. They don't even show up on much of our unemployment data because the unemployment data are based upon how many people are looking actively for work. If you add in all the unemployed and underemployed, we get to about 25 million Americans. That is a large percentage of the potential workforce. The Dow, I believe, that is major investors and minor investors and everybody else collectively around the country sees that not only is the economy almost dead in the water and anticipates tomorrow's unemployment report being very disappointing, but also knows that after the deal that was struck Tuesday to lift the debt limit, Washington's hands are now bound in terms of stimulating or boosting the economy. I, I, I dare not say the word stimulate anymore because it sounds, well, people say, well, the stimulus didn't work. Well, the stimulus did work. It just wasn't nearly big enough. It saved three million jobs, but it wasn't nearly big enough. The shortfall in demand that occurred in 2008 was very large, much larger than a $700 to $800 billion stimulus package spread over two years, especially when state and local governments are cutting budgets and raising taxes. In fact, state and local governments have wiped out, basically neutered, the entire federal stimulus package. So you needed much more by way of federal spending in order to make up for the shortfall in consumer and then business demand. Businesses, as I said, are not going to expand without consumers as customers. But now that you have the deal that was signed into law, and you know, and everybody else knows, and investors know, the federal government now is hamstrung in its capacity to respond to the shortfall in aggregate demand. A lot of individual investors who are wise, who are not ideological, who don't, this is not about whether you like government or don't like government or want a small government or want a big government, this is not that. This is just practical reality. A lot of investors say, we are in terrible trouble. And they're right. Now, I have a few more minutes before I take your questions, and I want to say something upbeat. <laughs> uh, here's my upbeat message. Number one, 
I think that with this kind of economic performance, this kind of performance on Wall Street, and again, could change tomorrow, one day, you know, you have to be a little bit careful about reading too much out of one day, but a number of days and, uh, and weeks go by, uh, you've got to start worrying that what Wall Street is doing is signaling what's happening generally. Uh, but let me just say that as the country begins to wake up to the fact that the debt is not the crisis, jobs, wages, and growth are the crisis, that that may change politics. Members of Congress are now home. I like the fact that they're home. <laughs> politics from, comes from the Greek word poly, meaning many, and ticks, small blood-sucking insects. <laughs> no, I don't. No, I don't really mean that. No, I, 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 I truly admire most people who are in Washington, you know, they could do much better for themselves doing something else. It is very hard work being there. But they're home. I like the fact they're home for a simple reason, because they're hearing, presumably, from their constituents. Hopefully, they're hearing from people who say to them, wait a minute, the issue is not the debt. The debt, I mean, the debt is a... What is, it's a potential problem 10 years from now, or maybe seven years from now, but what's the underlying debt problem? The underlying debt problem, really, is healthcare costs are rising, and they're out of control. And you add to that the baby boomers, who are retiring now, my class at Dartmouth, 1968, added to all of the people who are now turning 65, they're, an American is turning 65 every eight seconds. <laughs> 76 million baby boomers are going to start to retire. And 76 million baby boomer bodies are going to start corroding. <laughs> and healthcare costs are already on a trajectory that is out of control. Put those two together, and not only do we have a Medicare problem and a Medicaid problem, but we've got a huge problem. Individuals, healthcare costs, we've got to solve the problem. Dartmouth, by the way, is doing a wonderful job in terms of inspiring and leading the debate on how to control healthcare costs. But that is not a budget problem. The problem is healthcare costs and also the baby boomers. The real problem again now is jobs and wages. So my optimism is that they'll go home, they'll hear from people, and maybe there will be a, a recognition when they come back in five weeks. Maybe we ought to turn seriously to jobs and wages. And we can talk, depending upon your questions, about what to do. And I have some ideas, and you may have some ideas as well. Uh, the second thing that gives me optimism is my understanding of American history. When we know the problem, we put ideology aside. We roll up our sleeves and we get on with what needs to be done. Again and again and again, as a historian of American politics, I know this, you know this. The problem is not getting the problem right. But I have great, great faith in the capacity of this country to, once we know the problem, Winston Churchill once said, Americans always do the right thing after exhausting all the other alternatives. <laughs> the third thing that gives me optimism is that people are so tired of ideological baloney to use a polite term. I was on a television show not long ago, and during the station, I was debating somebody, and during the station break, uh, in my ear, the producer said, be angrier. <laughs> I said, I, you know, I thought we were having a very constructive debate. I, I actually enjoyed the debate. I think people were learning something. Uh, I don't want to be angry. She said, you have to be angrier. I said, why? And she said, because people are surfing through the channels, and they will stop when they hear people shouting at each other. <laughs> and I said, I'm not going to do it. She said, you have to do it. And then I lost my temper. <laughs> because you see, Americans really don't want a shouting match. 
We, they want solutions, and again, this is pervading, gradually pervading the Washington consciousness. So on those grounds, I'm also very optimistic. There is cause for concern. Not only the widening inequality that lies behind the flattening of the median wage, but also the suffering, human suffering, that is going on right now all over this country. But we will get through this as we get through every other crisis. This is not. Those of you who remember the Great Depression or World War II or Joe McCarthy and the communist scares, those of you who remember the civil rights battles and Vietnam, I mean, we will get through this. This is nothing compared to all of that. So cheer up. Thank you. It's time for some questions, and we adopted the convention that the last speaker gets to ask the current speaker a question. So the last speaker in the series was Joel Klein, Chancellor of uh, New York City Schools, who used his opportunity to pose two questions, um, one cause, uh, one uh, consequence. So they're really about the same thing, so let me pose these to you, and then we'll open the floor for questions. How much of the widening gap between haves and have-nots in America is a product of policies and how much is a product of us not training kids for the skills that the market demands? So to put it another way, how much can you solve with redistributive government policies, and how much requires that we ensure that our kids have the skills to compete in the 21st century global economy? Well, I, I think, Joel, <laughs> sort of odd answering question for somebody who's not here. Um, I think, Joel, you've got to do both. That is, uh, you've got to, in the short term, we've got to have tax reform that expands the something called the Earned Income Tax Credit, which is a wage subsidy going to relatively poor people, if they have jobs. Uh, but the advantage of that is putting more money in people's pockets. We may want to have also a temporary holiday, tax holiday, on the first $20,000 of income with regard to the payroll tax. Again, put money directly into people's pockets. Again, this is only for people who have jobs. Not going to bring jobs back immediately, but it's helpful to get money into people's pockets so they can turn around and buy. Uh, I think it's also important to, to the extent we can, reduce taxes on the middle class, uh, lower middle class. Uh, and uh, I do think over the long term we need to be concerned about our fiscal house, and I would call for uh, tax increases, uh, but more brackets at the top. It seems to me that uh, we have lost sight of the fact that the top 1% by income and wealth uh, now is taking about 22% of total income home, uh, which, if you look historically, has not occurred since the late 1920s. In fact, the peak years, interestingly, those of you economic historians, the peak years in terms of the top 1% and their percentage of the total income of America were 1928 and 2007. So, Joel, I would do something. I would, I would, I would, I would really uh, tax reform, expanding EITC, and so forth in the short term. You are undoubtedly correct that early childhood education, improving K through 12, uh, access to college, uh, access to good technical education if you're not going to college, uh, all of that is critically important. And I would. Uh, I would look at what works. We know it works. We know it doesn't work, but we have a lot of data on what works, like early childhood education. And I would put my money there, particularly. And one of the many interesting proposals you have at the end of the book is that um, college education, especially at state universities, should be free. So how would you, how would we accomplish yeah, I, that? I, I, one thing that I, I, I teach at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, I'm very aware uh, about a third of my students ha are there on Pell Grants, which means that they are from impoverished families. Uh, the other middle third uh, are struggling to pay tuition and fees that continue to go up because 
California, like many states, doesn't have the money and is cutting back on its subsidy to the state university. So I'm seeing students, uh, more and more qualified students who are either dropping out and going to work for a number of years, uh, or students who are graduating and then have huge, huge loans they have to pay back, and instead of doing what they want to do, uh, social workers or being defense attorneys or being musicians or artists or whatever, uh, what they're doing is getting the uh, most lucrative jobs they possibly can in order to pay back their loans. Uh, so my suggestion would be that we make public education uh, free uh, to everyone. In fact, no tuitions at all, but everyone who has a public education has got to pay into a fund 10% of their earnings for the first 10 years of full-time employment. And that fund, and I did a back of the envelope calculation, and it is about right, it may be 12%, but that fund would continue to fund public education, uh, which raises the question, what about private education? Uh, you know, I, I absolutely, as some of you, most of you, many of you, uh, I don't know how many of you are Dartmouth graduates. I love Dartmouth. Uh, I had a wonderful education here. Uh, my father went to Dartmouth, class of 1935. Uh, five days ago, I was in Florida with my father, who's now 97 and in great health, uh, and also one of his friends from the class of 39. And we started singing Dartmouth songs in a public restaurant. And they got into it. Dartmouth's in town again, right? I mean, they were really, uh, there was so, such a spirit. Uh, I love Dartmouth, but the question I keep on coming back to is in an economy and a society plagued by almost a record degree of widening inequality, what is the social responsibility of elite institutions like Dartmouth in terms of not simply generating more inequality, but actually training leaders and admitting people who are going to do something about this issue and other issues. I mean, there are a huge number of, of social problems. Uh, so I talked about public university education. I think we have to do something also uh, about private, the cost of private education at the same time. Were those, Joel, did I answer your question? Yes. OK. Yes. So we can take some questions from the audience now. If you have a question, raise your hand when we have people with microphones. Um, and I think I'm looking for a, a question from the students up front first. All right? This is a, you have to ask a question, someone, or I'm going to call out, call in. <laughs> Any questions? All right, let's see. Who, other than the students, do we have a question? It's right over here. If you are going to announce your uh, nomination for president, um, is there a person, is this a job that a person can really do? Is there, or is it a job that is more or less a lose-lose situation? How can someone tackle this myriad set of problems that there are? Is it possible? Uh, well, it, it, obviously, it, it is possible. It's very difficult. Uh, I think what happens, and I've seen, I've worked directly for one president and uh, a little bit at a lower level for uh, two other presidents, and then I've seen uh, President Obama fairly close, and I talked with him, I've talked with him in, in the Oval Office a number of times. What happens is that uh, a president gets into office, and it's, it really is. You've heard the metaphor about drinking through a fire hose. Uh, it, it, so much is coming at you that it's very difficult to have any time to just simply get your bearings. Uh, and the people around you uh, almost necessarily <coughs> begin playing tactical games rather than larger strategic or even principled games because they have got to keep up with what is currently happening. That's the problem for a president. Uh, the big advantage for a president is that nobody in the nation has the bully pulpit like the president. Nobody is capable of educating the country about the nature of where we've been, where we are, where we need to go, and what the essential public problems are that need to be addressed. And that's the biggest. I mean, we have 
uh, in President Obama, a potentially an educator in chief. And without public understanding, I said this beginning at the beginning, but I want to reemphasize this, without a public understanding of what the nature of the problem is, what we need to do, it's very hard to do anything. Another question right here. Uh, just to follow up on what you just said, um, it may be that Obama should be educating and using his bully pulpit, but what good is that when a significant minority has set control and can't pass legislation? Uh, well, I think, and again, I'm perhaps an eternal optimist, I think that the public is smarter than that. Uh, yes, minorities, uh, in this case, uh, Tea Partiers who, and I know some of them, and I've talked with some of them about what their beliefs, and I respect their beliefs, but many of them feel that the biggest hindrance to the country going forward is government, and that what we need to do is shrink government, and therefore jobs will come back and the economy will improve. And I ask them over and over again, uh, I respect you. Maybe you don't like government for a variety of reasons, and that's fine, but tell me exactly how shrinking government when you have so much of a shortfall in aggregate demand between what we could be doing at full employment and what demand is on the basis of consumers and businesses, when we have that much shortfall, how is shrinking government the answer? And they cannot respond. And I think that uh, the public is not dumb. I think what, what the president needs to do, and he began to do this when he signed the bill to raise the debt limit. What he needs to do is to uh, make sure the public knows that the number one problem is jobs, wages, and the economy. That's what all the polls show the public believes anyway. And then he should say, here is what my jobs plan is. Here's what I'm going to do. And I will fight for it. And I'm not going to let a small minority stop me. And if you don't want them to stop me, vote the people out of office who are trying to stop me. In other words, he brings it to the people, makes it about the 2012 election. Yes, right here. You're a very good teacher. Can you teach Obama to teach the country? <laughs> I think I will pass on that question. Uh, let's see, back here in the, yes, that row right there, yes, thank you. What we have witnessed recently, the antagonism between the two parties has been very destructive and President Obama apparently has not been strong enough to twist arms. What would it take for these people to take the interest of the country above the interest of their party or maybe their state? Uh, look, let's, let's give people the benefit of the doubt before we assume that it's just partisanship. I, I, I mean, it is true, Mitch McConnell has said very clearly and openly, and other Republicans have said their number one objective is to get Obama out of office in 2012. Uh, but there are many principled people who are uh, Tea Partiers or who want smaller government. Uh, and uh, I think what it takes, uh, and I'm going to go back to this theme again, what it really takes is for the public to understand the challenge in front of us. Uh, they're not going to change their ideology. The Tea Party is not going to change. If they want smaller government, they want smaller government. Uh, but the rest of the country really does have to wake up. Many people whine. Uh, do you, you know the whiners? I mean, I, I can't tell you how many people call me or write to me or email me, and I get whines, screeds. Oh, heavens, this is awful. I can't stand it. I can't stand Obama. I can't stand the Democrats. I can't stand progressives. I hate the Republicans. I, this is awful. We're just in terrible shape. I can't stand it. I'm so depressed. I'm so... You know what I say back to them? What are you going to do about it? If you don't organize 
and mobilize and take an active role as citizens. If you go into despair and cynicism, then the other side, however you want to define the other side, they win completely. Nothing good happens in Washington unless the public is mobilized, energized, and organized to make sure it does happen. Well, so far, all the questions have come from the left side of the audience. Do we have any <laughs> questions from the right side over here? How about uh, right back there, uh, closest to you? Or here's fine, yes, this row, right here. I would appreciate if you would comment on the relationship between tax policy and job creation. We hear so much about you can't tax the rich because they create the jobs, and I don't believe it, but I'm sure that you're more insightful. Uh, well, I'm not sure I'm more insightful, but let me just say that uh, if you look at history, you see that the biggest economic advances, the biggest period of annualized economic growth, uh, the longest period of job creation we have had, occurred not only between the end of the Second World War in 1974, when the marginal taxes on the wealthy were over 70 percent. I mean, under Dwight D. Eisenhower, the marginal tax paid by the richest in America was 91 percent. Now, granted, after you get rid of deductions and credits, it was below that, but still way off the radar screen of anybody today. That was a period of enormous prosperity. Now, people say back to me, but we didn't have international competition. We didn't have this. We didn't have that. Uh, let me tell you, Germany t today is doing extremely well. It has very high marginal income taxes. The top 1% is taking home not 22%, as here in the United States, but 11%. What Germany is doing today, and I'm not trying to suggest we emulate Germany, I'm just saying it's not just three, three decades after the Second World War. It's actually a strategy that is based upon educating people, investing in people, uh, having adequate aggregate demand at home. Uh, Germany is a major manufacturing exporter. How can it be with such high wages? Well, it can be because it's looking at precision manufacturing. And again, training a lot of its population very well. Bill Clinton raised taxes. He didn't lower taxes. During his eight years of his presidency, 22 million net new jobs were created in the United States. That was primarily because I was Labor Secretary. Uh, but, we, uh, but, but let me just say, we raised, that's not true, we, but we did raise taxes, he raised taxes, and at the end of the Clinton administration, not only were 22 million net new jobs created, but we had a surplus, not a deficit, a surplus of $5 trillion. George Bush lowered taxes, mostly on the wealthy, and over his eight years, 8 million, not 22 million, 8 million jobs were created, and the median wage, which went up under Bill Clinton, dropped. Nothing trickled down. Trickle-down economics, how can I say it politely, <laughs> is a lie. It's been proven again and again in American economic history as being based upon false assumptions that do not add up. Question right here. I'm sitting, oh, I'm sitting here on the right, um, your left, but my right. And I think your analysis that customers are the problem is a vast oversimplification. You underestimate, I'm also a small business owner, and I live next to a small business owner who has had a half million dollars in costs added through EPA regulations and Obamacare. He's not hiring people. If people don't have jobs, they're not customers. Well, if you follow my remarks, I, I, I said that undoubtedly some uncertainty and maybe some concern about regulations and maybe the cost of capital 
all play a part, but the overwhelming, and again, I've looked at surveys, I've interviewed small businesses and big businesses, I've done focus groups. Uh, it, this is not debated, this is not something that, you know, maybe it's true, maybe it's not true. This is overwhelmingly understood. Wall Street Journal yesterday has a big article on the lack of consumer demand. That's what the problem is. The other things are maybe 5% of the problem. I'm not saying you're wrong. Um, but 95% of the problem is consumer demand. It's aggregate demand that is inadequate. That's another question uh, right here. Uh, what do you think is feasible for the government to accomplish between now and 2012, and would it require most of the uh, policy to be coming from the administration rather than the legislative branch? Um, what is feasible? Well, feasibility is often in the eyes of the beholder in Washington. Uh, a lot of people uh, think things cannot be done, but it turns out the public wants them done and they get done. Uh, I think what we need between now and the end of 2012 would be, for example, uh, I would have a, I would exempt the first $20,000 of income from payroll taxes. I would amend the bankruptcy laws to allow distressed homeowners to declare bankruptcy on their primary residence to give them more bargaining leverage with lenders so that they can reorganize their loans. I would allow the federal government to lend money to strapped, cash-strapped states and locales so that they don't have to keep on laying off teachers and firefighters and police officers and make the situation that much worse. With those loans uh, paid back when unemployment reaches a certain trigger level, low or lower than it is now. And if the states don't pay it back, the states will be tagged. That is, the federal uh, money to those states won't, won't come uh, at that time. That is, there'll be an automatic lending uh, facility. Uh, I would provide partial unemployment insurance to people who have been laid off from part-time jobs. Right now, if you have a part-time job, uh, you get no unemployment insurance. Uh, there, in other words, uh, there are a variety of things that can be done. A, a tax uh, benefit for employers who add net new employment, not just new employment, because we don't want to game the system. We don't want them to fire Peter to pay and get the tax benefit for Paul. Uh, we want net new employment, maybe a tax benefit for those employers. Uh, an infrastructure bank makes some sense because even though there was some concern about the faith and credit of the United States, uh, the 10 year treasury is still very cheap. I mean, I was talking about you know, borrowing money. The federal government can borrow very, very inexpensively right now. We've got huge problems with everything concerned with deferred maintenance on roads and bridges. I was driving up uh, uh, here yesterday from Boston and, you know, those, <coughs> what are we doing? I was in a traffic jam for about, about three hours. Uh, congestion of our highways, I can go on and on and on. A WPA, a, a Civilian Conservation Corps. I mean, a lot of people are, are in long-term unemployment, over 50 years old, they're not going to get back in the labor force unless there's some way to get them back in directly. In other words, there's no lack of ideas. There's a lack of political will, which may, is made more difficult by the deal that was just signed into law. But the optimistic part of my brain says all of these people from Congress, and you know, they're, they're talking to their constituents right now. They can see what happened to the Dow. They're going to be able to see what happened to employment tomorrow in July. There is going to be mounting pressure on them to take some action and on the president. So what is politically feasible uh, come five weeks from now may be different from what is politically feasible today. We unfortunately have time for one more question, and that's it. So let's... Uh, this better be a in great question. In the very back question. there right in front of you? Yes. <laughs> Because I want the kind of question that allows me to summarize everything I've said and... Yeah, right there. Don't feel any pressure. <laughs> I'd like to know your opinion on the relationship 
between our campaign finance structure and the ability or inability of our government to solve problems. Um. Well, I, I agreed a while back to become chairman of an organization called Common Cause. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, which is dedicated to getting money out of politics to the extent that it distorts politics. Uh, now, the Supreme Court has not made life easy. Uh, the grotesque, and I want to underline grotesque, decision in Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission, uh, arguing absurdly that corporations are people and can spend as much as they want, really undermines the First Amendment rights of everybody else. Uh, I think we have to fight that. We have to work for public financing, and by public financing I simply mean that when you get to a certain level of credibility, maybe into a primary, you can and are eligible for a dollar of public financing for every dollar that your opponent raises privately. So you eliminate any advantage altogether. Now again, the Supreme Court has indicated it doesn't like that. Well, let's change the Supreme Court. But, but, but just to summarize, yes. Getting money, improving our democracy, making democracy work better, reducing the impact of interest groups that really don't have the public interest in mind but have the private interest in mind is critical to a lot of the reforms we've been talking about today. But go back to my optimism, I think that is possible. Nobody, nobody assumed McCain-Feingold was possible. It turned out it was, and for a time, it worked pretty well. We need to go the next step. And uh, on that upbeat note. Well, there's, there's one more. Oh, there is one more. There's one more thing we have to do, the part that I've really been looking forward to, and that is uh, there's one last question. That's the question that you get to pose to our next speaker. Um, and I looked up who our next speaker would be. Now, maybe this question is a segue to your question, but our next speaker is your Dartmouth classmate and former Treasury Secretary, Hank Paulson. So when he is sitting in that chair, what would you like him to have to answer? Uh, Hank, I got two related questions for you. Uh, number one, why in the Wall Street bailout did you not condition those funds on Wall Street doing several things that it needed to do, particularly with regard to mortgage mitigation? and also making money available to Main Street through small regional banks, and also putting some constraints on lobbying by Wall Street firms, particularly during the period of time Congress was trying to reform the financial system. And, and secondly, Hank, after you explain all of that, I would like you to tell us whether the social benefits of Wall Street exceed the social costs. Thank you, Hank.